Hopefully FastWeb can do uh, a process much the same. And that's another resource that you can use. Both these web websites have a large database of scholarships that you can consider. Um, we also have here scholarships.com and scholarshipexperts.com as another set of resources that you can consider. And in terms of the scholarships that would have the smallest applicant pools, the local scholarships that I talked about, there are a number of other sources where you can find this information in particular. It could be the people in your school, like your guidance counselor, or it could be through the school district website, local libraries or volunteer organizations, and then also college access programs and advisors like College Possible or similar programs that are supporting students to try and get to and get through college would likely have information about scholarships that you can apply to. Next, I want to shift a little bit and address one of these other kinds of aid that we talked about, and um, that's loans. So as Colin mentioned, loans are something that we might be generally familiar with as money that we would borrow and then pay back in addition to some interest for um, some extra money that we pay back for having borrowed it. And within the big category of loans, there are a lot of different kinds. And so the first kind that I have here on this slide for us to look at has to do with government loans. Uh, these are government student loans. You'll see the, the federal Perkins loan, two different kinds of federal direct loans. One is subsidized and one is unsubsidized uh, and a parent plus loan. Something to note about the Perkins loan and the subsidized loans is that they are need-based. So they are reserved for students who demonstrate the most financial need in order to be able to afford college. Also, uh, just to pause because it's a common question about what the term subsidized or unsubsidized refer to. So when you take out a student loan through the government um, and you're in college, there is interest that is building up on that loan. So that's the money that you would be paying at when it comes time to pay it, um, once it's time to start repaying the loan after college. The difference between a subsidized and unsubsidized loan is that while you're a student in school, the interest that would be building up would be paid off by the government for a subsidized loan. They're providing that subsidy to pay that interest for you while you're a student. The, and then the difference is that for the unsubsidized version, that that interest would be the student's responsibility after they finish school, either after graduating or after leaving school for other reasons. And then we talked about government loans, but then there's also the category of private loans. These are loans that you can find through banks and credit unions, and you can apply for as much as you need up to the cost of attendance. Um, a credit check is required for the private loans. And something to know is that whereas the government student loans have fixed interest rates and some um, perhaps better terms for a student uh, in terms of um, making it easier to pay back in some ways, uh, private student loans do not necessarily have some of those same benefits. And so when I am advising students about which loans are most preferable, if I go back to our last screen a little bit, I start by recommending that if they're eligible for the Perkins and subsidized loans, that those are the ones that are the best suited loans to take. Um, and then moving through the other government loan options. And then if for some reason those do not work out and there is additional uh, money that is needed and that a loan might be helpful, a private loan might be helpful to achieve that, then moving on to private loans from there. And just to add one last thing about the loans piece. Um, so we mentioned that government loans are better than private loans because of the lower interest rates uh, and the better terms. And specifically, government loans, without getting into too much detail, they are able to be forgiven um, for a variety of reasons. So if you're making regular payments on most of those government loans for 25 years, I think is the general um, limit there, then the rest of the money, if there's still money left over, is forgiven. Uh, or there are other deals like if you work for 10 years uh, serving for the government or a nonprofit, then the rest of your loans get forgiven if you're making regular payments. Um, those are some of the benefits of government loans that private loans don't necessarily have those terms. No problem. Um, so we're wrapping up here. Um, and there have been lots of questions, so we'll make sure to get to those at the end. 
Um, but just a few points to ramp up. So there are four point or four types of financial aid, as we mentioned, grants and scholarships, those are the free, the free ones, free money, work study, that's the earned aid, uh, working part time at the school, and then loans, which John just talked about, which is money you've got to pay back. Um, most students are going to pay for college through some combination of these, um, and particularly low income students are going to pay for them uh, through a, a variety of different methods, including these, including personal savings, savings contributions from the family. There's also, uh, we can go into it, but military uh, options exist. Um, different branches of the military often uh, offer different kinds of uh, incentives to help pay for college. So if that's something a student is interested in, we'd encourage you to just look into it and just be as, as informed as possible about those options. Um, and then if you have questions about any of these types of financial aid, the best people to talk to are, are going to be financial aid officers at the colleges. In the end, the colleges are the ones that are charging the students money to attend the schools. And, and they're, they're the ones who interface with the government and all these other organizations to receive the money to help pay that bill. Uh, and so they're going to be the ones who are best suited to, to assist students in, in paying for college. They can sometimes help set up payment plans as well with students and just help inform students of opportunities for institutional scholarships, for example, that the student uh, may have missed the first time around on their own. And Finally, college can be affordable for low-income students. I would say college is affordable for low-income students. I think a lot of people get, not just low-income students, but just about everybody, get scared by the sticker price of college a lot of times. The published prices of tuition and fees and room and board uh, tend to be very, very high. $50,000, uh, for example, at some schools. Um, and the fact is that most students, particularly low-income students, don't end up paying that much money because they qualify for so much financial aid. Um, and so there's so much help out there and the students just have to be proactive and they have to fill out the FAFSA and, and do it in a timely manner. They have to uh, make sure they submit uh, these scholarships and financial aid applications in time. So you have to be make a calendar for yourself with deadlines to make sure that you meet them and just constantly be vigilant for ways that you can get money for college. Um, constantly be looking for scholarships and planning for that, even when you're in college. Unfortunately, the it doesn't stop there. Once you're in college, um, some of these scholarships that John talked about are renewable, that they are guaranteed for four years. And some of them are just one-time scholarships. So you may find scholarships for $2,000 but it's only a one-time scholarship. So you have that money for your freshman year, but you've got to pay tuition and room and board again for your sophomore year. So you've got to keep looking for that. And the FAFSA is another thing that you have to fill out um, every year you want to go to school. Um, it gets a little easier after the first time, I would say though. And so we provided general information here. Uh, we work in Minnesota, and so uh, there are going to be slightly different uh, state rules and state uh, opportunities elsewhere. So um, if you've got any specific uh, geographic questions or specific student situational questions, um, ask a local financial aid officer, ask the financial aid officer, as I said, at your school. You know, when you fill out the FAFSA, for example, you're answering the questions that they ask you. And, and there may be some questions that they don't ask you that you feel are important. Uh, maybe there wasn't a question uh, that that asked, do you pay uh, a large sum of money in medical expenses for some reason? Uh, that even though you make a certain amount of income, a lot of that income goes towards these medical expenses, for example. That's a kind of special circumstance that colleges want to know about. Um, they will often uh, work with students to help make things work in situations like that. Uh, so I think that's, that's the end. We've just got our, our contact information here. Uh, so you can feel free to shoot us an email if you've got questions. But at this point, I feel free to type in a question if you've got it, and um, and we'll scroll through some of these questions and um, see if we can get get to a few of them here. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Uh, first question we have is how soon can you apply for the facts? Yeah, I think we answered that one. Um, so January 1st is when the FAFSA for the following academic year uh, becomes available. So 
for this next academic year, if you're planning on going to school in the fall of 2014, uh, then it's open now. So you can apply right now, but it might be difficult um, if you have not filed your taxes already. There's another sort of related question. It says, my child set out a year after graduation in 2013. Can she claim her income for 2013 on the FAFSA? Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, it's, it's basically what what income, what year of income should she report on the, on the FAFSA? And it's always asking about the previous year's income. Um, so whether or not you've taken a year off or two years even, the FAFSA is always going to ask for your current financial situation as based on the previous year's uh, wages and income. Um, so I think, I hope that answered that question there. Uh, next one related about the FAFSA, I'm self-employed and have been advised that the tax forms won't be available until mid-February. Uh, is this too long to wait? It's not. Um, there are priority deadlines, as I mentioned, usually in March, really you should check with specific schools. And the colleges, even though they do have sort of early deadlines sometimes, are pretty understanding that, you know, sometimes you just can't do your taxes until you get all the forms that you need from your employers or from being self-employed. You can also submit an estimated FAFSA, which uh, in some ways is almost as good. So you can, if you don't have your um, 2013 tax return available, you can estimate what your 2013 income might have been. And there's a place on the FAFSA where you can say, this is an estimated FAFSA. Fill out the information and still submit it as though it was a regular FAFSA. And the government will get that information and the colleges will get that information. Uh, and oftentimes colleges will send you an estimated financial aid package based on that estimated income. And then it's very easy once you get your taxes done um, to, to log into the FAFSA and make changes, corrections they're called, to the FAFSA with your up-to-date information. Um, you can submit an estimated one. Let's see here. Do you want to take that one, John? Oh, sure. We have a question here about which websites do you recommend for searching and applying for scholarships? So um, in one of our previous slides, and maybe we can call that slide up. Sure. Um, we have a few websites that we have uh, referenced here with College Greenlight, Fast Web, Scholarships.com, and ScholarshipExperts.com. So I think that's a good combination to get started with as some resources to search for scholarships. And if you're just trying to focus on one uh, right now, I probably recommend starting with College Greenlight. You can create a profile for yourself where you'll describe some qualities about yourself and it'll help um, to narrow down the field of all those scholarships that are out there um, to ones that are well suited for you. So I think that's a good place to start, but also remember to talk to someone locally about scholarships that would be um, eligible for a local audience, someone like your guidance counselor in high school or some local community agencies who might have that information. Well, we've got another question um, that's basically asking if you if you end up getting more money than, than it costs to attend that college, like if tuition is a certain amount of money, but you receive, you know, maybe the Pell Grant and the state grant, and then you've got a scholarship for an extra $10,000 and you end up sort of bumping up above that, maybe you've got 2,000 extra dollars than the tuition uh, and fees and room and board of the college, do you get to keep that money or maybe save it for the following year? And um, the Pell Grants and the state grants and these government grants and the scholarship money that the colleges are giving you, I don't think that's ever going to exceed the cost of um, tuition usually. Um, where, where that could conceivably happen is if you've got that money and then additionally you win some scholarships. You're super awesome, you win a bunch of scholarships, maybe you get a little extra money. It will depend a little bit on, on what the terms of the scholarship are. Some few scholarships give you a check, but most scholarships are going to pay that money directly to the college. And one thing to know about how colleges calculate the cost of attending their school, um, uh, it's not just tuition, right? It's not just the cost of the classes and stuff. It's not just room and board paying for food and, and staying there. They also include in their cost of attendance uh, calculation, like how much money are you going to spend in transportation to like get to and from school, maybe during winter break or something. Uh, maybe you're, you're moving across country. 
personal expenses, like you got to buy shampoo, stuff like that. Um, and so if you've got an extra thousand or two thousand dollars from a scholarship or something, often uh, it will be OK for you to keep that money and then spend it on those extra personal expenses, transportation expenses. Books are often a big expense um, that isn't reflected in the tuition fees. So that's what you could conceivably do with that extra money. And we have uh, another question here. Um, so it says, if my school didn't let me know that I have work study, am I still able to get the work study money? And that's a really good question. So not every financial aid package that you receive, that's the letter from the letter, the email from a college, once you've been accepted, that would tell you how much financial aid they're able to give you. Not every one of those will include work study. Um, and that can be an important form of financial aid to help afford college, like we talked about. So for those that don't, and if it's something that you are interested in, what I would definitely recommend is to follow up and to call or uh, email to contact the financial aid office. And maybe you have a specific financial aid counselor who's been assigned to you. Otherwise, even if they don't, they should have someone there that can talk to you so that uh, you can explain that you're interested in that and to find out if there's a possibility for that to be included in your aid package. Um, it isn't always the case that they're able to do that just for asking, but it doesn't do any harm to ask. And in best case scenario, um, by showing your interest in it, they might have some extra work study money available um, that you could then be given um, as um, the opportunity to work for it through that campus job. And I would say uh, that some schools, that schools deal with work study differently um, from each other. So you might have work study listed on your financial aid package. You have $2,000 a semester or something. So $4,000 a year for work study. Great. Well, you've got to earn that money by working a job. And some colleges will just like assign you a job, give you a card that says, here's your job. Um, some colleges, though, uh, you just have to find your own job uh, on using their campus uh, search uh, system. And so you, have, you may have to be proactive in order to actually get that uh, work study job. Uh, we have another question. Would it be possible for you to provide a link to your presentation? I cannot read the links. Sorry about that. Uh, I am not super sure if College of Live is going to provide a copy of this presentation. Um, my understanding is that they will. Um, and yes, it will be uh, it will be on uh, after we finish. So that will be on demand after we finish. Mm -hmm. So it will be available. Thank you for asking that. Got another question that says, I'm going to going to a school outside of the state. Do I apply to local scholarships in my state or the state I'm going to school uh, in? That's an interesting question. I, I think when we say local scholarships, we're saying um, maybe check with your high school, college, and career center. Maybe you've got some folks who have graduated from that high school 30 years ago and are doing well for themselves and want to donate some money to the graduates of that high school, for example, and want to provide like a $5,000 one-time scholarship to students graduating from such and such high school to go to whatever college they want. In that case, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're going to school out of state or not. Um, so it is, I guess, going to depend a little bit on what, what the specific scholarship rules are. Uh, some local scholarships might say, like, we're going to give you a local scholarship uh, if you graduate from a school in Minnesota, for example, and you go to a Minnesota public school. And so in that case, there are limitations in the scholarship about what school you can go to. Um, so that's what we mean when we say local scholarships. I don't think you'd really be able to apply uh, to a local scholarship in another state, if that makes sense. Okay, reading another question here. Uh, for my 2013 tax year, I only received unemployment compensation, so my tax return will only be based on that. I'm not sure how to fill out the FAFSA if I won't get a W-2. What sections do I have to fill out for this income, or where can I get help for this? Excellent question. Um, I did mention the W-2. You'll get that if you work. Um, 
but you don't need a W-2 to fill out the FAFSA if you didn't work. Um, the FAFSA isn't just for people who work and get income in that way. Uh, as I said, the FAFSA is just a way for people to, for the government and colleges to collect an accurate picture of your financial situation. And if your financial situation is, is receiving unemployment compensation, that's just fine. The FAFSA will, uh, I think, actually ask that question specifically about did you receive unemployment? Um, they'll ask if you received Social Security income, um, things like that. You may or may not have to report an actual number. Um, and then even if you don't fill out a tax return, some people aren't required to file taxes. Uh, you don't, if you make under a certain amount of money, you're not required to file taxes. Uh, and so that's okay too. There's an option early on in the FAFSA that says, um, you know, choose one of these. I already filed my tax return. I, I haven't filed my tax return, but I'm going to, and that's the estimated FAFSA, or I don't need to file tax returns. And in that case, they'll ask you a different set of questions. That's kind of the cool thing about the FAFSA online is that it's um, it's got what's called skip logic. It's sort of a smart questionnaire that the questions change based on how you answer. So if you, don't, if you say, I didn't file a tax return, it's not gonna ask you questions about your tax return. So, and you can get help on that on the FAFSA website. And um, and there are also, like I said, the College Goal Sunday website um, lists different FAFSA nights that you can go get help from, from people in person. Uh, another question, does it cost to get someone to help fill out the FAFSA? Um, it doesn't have to, but like I just said, uh, College Goal Sunday, um, if you go to that website, uh, which I think is collegegoalsundayusa.com. Yeah. Um, that, those are going to be free FAFSA nights where people will help you fill that out. If you go to someplace like fafsa.com, which, again, I would not recommend, you can pay people to do your FAFSA, but you shouldn't have to pay people to do your FAFSA. Um, there should be enough free resources um, to, to get help filling out the FAFSA. And I'd encourage you just to take a look at it on your own if you haven't already. I think it they've got a lot of help menus and things that, that are pretty helpful as well. Uh, we have uh, another question here uh, asking about a two-income family situation. And I think if I understand the question right, it's asking about uh, how much income would qualify someone for need-based financial aid and scholarships. And that uh, can really vary uh, depending from school to school. And so if there is any question about that, I still recommend that every family uh, who is working with a student who is applying to colleges fills out the FAFSA. Um, again, it's a free application, so there's no cost to it. And there's potentially financial aid that is available for having completed it. So since that number isn't really set in stone, certainly across schools and oftentimes even within a school, it's still worth your while, um, even with a, a two income family situation, um, to make sure that the family is completing the FAFSA. And then the financial aid office can get back to you and let you know about what aid, if any, uh, you'd be eligible for. And I just circled here on, on the slides, FAFSA Forecaster. This exists exactly for this purpose. If you're unsure about what kind of need-based financial aid you might get, you can go to the FAFSA Forecaster website here uh, and uh, you can enter in some basic stuff like income of, of the parents and assets and get a sense of how much federal aid you might get. And frankly, even if that says zero dollars, you know, I think it's still worth it to fill out the FAFSA. It's free. It doesn't take that much time. And and you're going to, colleges are going to use that information to see, you know, maybe there is something that we can set aside to help this family. All right, and let's see, our next question here uh, talks about having filled out a FAFSA and asking, uh, let's see, do the results from the FAFSA automatically get sent to the high school and colleges, or do we need to print it out somehow and send it with applications? That's a great question. One of the things that you'll find as you go through the FAFSA application is that it will have a place to enter in school codes. These are code numbers that help identify the schools that you're interested in that you want to receive this information. So that could be the school code for the colleges you're applying to who would want to know about what financial aid 
uh, you would be eligible for. You know, they'll use that finding from the FAFSA to help determine what financial aid they might be able to offer you. And I also see here in the question reference to applying for scholarships and filling out the FAFSA as being relevant to that. So similarly, a lot of those scholarships uh, might have a code as well in the FAFSA that you can enter in their code, and then the FAFSA information would be automatically sent to them as well. So um, in a lot of those situations, it would happen automatically as long as you make sure to enter in those codes to identify the schools you wanted to go to or the scholarship programs you wanted to go to. That being said, there are some scholarship programs probably that uh, do not have a code listed there, and they would probably have their own instructions to follow up with that program individually and ask if it is something, in fact, where you would need to print out the results from your FAFSA and to provide that to them. That might happen as well. But in general, make sure to pay attention to those school codes or scholarship program codes and to enter those in for your FAFSA so that it gets to the right people uh, at your colleges and scholarships to help make sure that you're able to receive the aid that you can. Yeah, good question about the logistics of the FAFSA. And this questioner also says, uh, you know, we filled out the FAFSA and it reported back that we didn't qualify for anything but a student loan. When you fill out the FAFSA, all it's going to report back to you is going to give you what's called a SAR, S-A-R, student aid report. So on the student aid report, that you'll get emailed to you. All it's going to say uh, is your, your EFC, which is, stands for expected family contribution, which is just a number that helps colleges um, uh, figure out how much money they can help you out with, basically. Uh, and it's going to give you back all of the answers that you answered on the FAFSA. So you can review it and you can make sure that everything's accurate. You're not going to know what kind of money you're going to get from the colleges until you do what John was talking about, which is enter, which you do on the FAFSA, which is entering the schools that you want to send the FAFSA to. Once the schools get uh, the FAFSA, then they'll send you that financial aid package and then you'll see exactly what kind of financial aid you're going to qualify. Let's see here. We have a question that says, my husband and I do not make much money, but this year we had a one-time stock option payout. Is that gonna hurt on the FAFSA by giving the appearance that we have more money than we really do? Um, good question, uh, and a specific question. And it, it can be hard to answer super specific questions about the FAFSA, and it can be very hard to sort of guess like how the FAFSA is going to read something. Like, I, like I've said a couple of times before, the FAFSA is designed to accurately capture the financial situation of a family. And so, you know, if you've got some one-time stock option, stock option payout or some other sort of one-time thing, uh, you know, if it's something that you're going to get a, a um, like you get a W-2 if you work, and that's a record of you working, you might get a 1099 or some other form that, that records that stock option payout or something like that. Um, if you then use that to fill out your taxes, and then the FAFSA will ask you questions about your tax return, and that way, that will be reflected in your FAFSA. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just gonna it's gonna create a picture of that year of 2013 in this case um, that that may or may not include that stock option payout, depending on what questions it asks you, basically. If you're concerned that that, because that, if you're concerned that that one time money that you got sort of gives them the impression that you've got more money or you think it um, abnormally inflates your income, um, then that's the kind of special circumstance that you would want to contact the financial aid officers at the school about. Um, and say, look, I filled out the FAFSA and it, and it says I made this much money, but that was just a one-time thing and, I, and I'm not gonna make that much money the next three years to pay for college. That's the kind of thing that they would take into account and a college might increase the amount of like institutional scholarships and grants that they give you to help offset that potentially. Mm -hmm. So, And also related to that, as Callum talked about earlier, the FAFSA is something that each year of college a student would be completing again. And that's because it gives that snapshot, that one year picture of a student in a family's financial situation. And so regardless of what that response would be from the college, if you let them know about a unique circumstance for this year, you can also know that in the next year and the year after that, um, that they would again be looking to get an updated picture so that if that was a one-time 
uh, you know, additional amount of money that you ended up with, that it wouldn't um, count against you in any way for future years too, um, because that that new year would be evaluated each time. We have another question that says, uh, my senior did work in 2013. When we fill out the FAFSA, do I need her 2013 tax info in addition to mine? Uh, good question. I didn't. I don't think I addressed this. Uh, it's it's meant to accurately capture the financial information of the family, and so there are questions that ask about parent FAFSA or sorry, parent financial uh, situations and student financial situations. So there'll be like identical questions that ask, you know, how much money did the student make in 2013? Uh, how much money does the student have in their bank account? And then also, how much money did the parent make in 2013? How much money does the parent have in their bank account? So, yes, um, if the student worked, um, they would need their tax information as well as yours. Uh, we have a question here um, asking that uh, would most colleges consider uh, that uh, uh, an only parent uh, who is on disability as a special circumstance. And uh, that is definitely something that uh, you would want to communicate to your financial aid officer at the college because that is the kind of special circumstance that they would want to make sure they're aware of and that could um, it could affect the amount of aid that they're able to offer. Um, and so that's the kind of important information. So really, it's a really good question because I think that it can apply to a number of different uh, unique situations that um, a student and their family might be experiencing, and communicating that with a financial aid counselor would definitely be a good idea. Yes, great. We've got a couple more questions here. We'll try to get to it. We just have a few more minutes. Uh, if a parent doesn't qualify for a PLUS loan, can the student apply for additional funds to cover college costs? If so how does that work? That's a great question. Um, John, do you want to answer this question? I feel like you might know more than me about this. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, it's, it is a great question. So in applying for the PLUS loan, there is a credit check involved. And if a parent does not qualify for the loan, there is then an additional unsubsidized uh, government loan, unsubsidized uh, direct loan that the student is then eligible for. Um, I believe that the amount is up to $4,000. It can vary. Um, but yes, so by applying for the Parent PLUS loan, even if it turns out that the parent does not qualify, that is still helpful to the student because it does allow for that additional amount of unsubsidized federal loan to be available to the student. Good question. Uh, another question that says, when will we find out the amount of financial aid we'll receive? Does that come from the government or the individual schools? My son has narrowed his college choices down to three, but I think it will depend on how much aid we get in order to make that choice. Absolutely. Um, so you'll fill out the FAFSA as soon as you can this year, and, and you'll say in the FAFSA what schools you want the FAFSA to be sent to, and then those schools will, I, will, I would say, in the, uh, in the well, it kind of depends on the school, but the early spring, maybe, you might start getting financial aid packages from the individual schools. It kind of just depends on when you submit your FAFSA. Uh, and what the timeline is for the schools. If you've got it narrowed down to three schools, the schools should have on their website, on their financial aid page, uh, like when the FAFSA is due, and often it will say like when, um, perhaps when you might get financial aid packages. You could also just email the financial aid officers at the school, they would be happy to answer those kinds of questions. And absolutely that information is very important uh, in determining uh, what school to go to. Uh, National Decision Day, quote unquote, is May 1st. Uh, it's sort of an unofficial time where uh, schools expect students to make a decision about what school to go to. So certainly before that day, you should you should have packages. Although I will say that public schools, at least in Minnesota, tend to be a little bit later than private schools uh, in dealing out that aid information, those financial aid packages, the final ones anyway. And that tends to be because state governments uh, can have a hard time deciding on budgets for that sort of thing. So we are right about at the end of the time. Yeah. Uh, should we answer this one more last question, perhaps? Exactly. Okay, last question. Some private colleges and universities require the CSS. Do you have any resources uh, to complete this document in a timely manner? Uh, great question. The CSS profile uh, is um, that this questioner is referring to is an is another. Um, 
financial aid questionnaire like the FAFSA um, that some colleges, mostly private colleges, universities require um, in addition to the FAFSA. And so this uh, is put out by the College Board. So if you, I don't have a link on our slideshow, but if you just Google CSS profile or CSS profile College Board or something like that, or go to the College Board website, um, you should be able to find a link to that application. Uh, it is a little complex. It's it's like a more complicated version of the FAFSA. It asks more questions um, to, to get at more uh, details about a family's financial situations um, for those colleges. And so, it, although it's a little more complicated than FAFSA, it's still a, a helpful website. Um, so I'd encourage you to just poke around and, and uh, look at their help documents there. So thank you all for your questions. And I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of them, but we did want to make sure to share again our contact information so that any remaining questions or any additional questions you think of, they can feel free to contact us and we'll be able to respond and hopefully share some information that can be helpful to you as well. So thanks for all your participation today. And I guess it's about time we wrap up. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.